Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Laura Freeman, as we continue with the week devoted entirely to UK health professionals that specialize in lifestyle medicine. And please welcome Dr. Freeman to the show. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that you guys have a pretty much a movement, a plant-based, whole food, plant-based lifestyle medicine movement in the UK. It's just, it's so exciting to know that other countries are doing this. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. I think, you know, it'll come up and when we chat that I moved back to the UK a couple of years ago. And so to kind of find my plant-based healthcare professional tribe when I was here has been, has been amazing. And super exciting. But nobody was born a lifestyle medicine doctor. So I'd, I'd love to know about your journey, how you got from there to where you are today. Yeah, well, yeah, I would really love to tell you it was uh, in medical school 20 years ago. Um, but that was, of course, much more focused on disease rather than health and prescriptions rather than nutrition. Um, so it was really only 15 years later after I left medical school that um, I found out about lifestyle medicine and that was really because I became a patient myself. Um, so in 2016, I, my obstetrician at the time found a lump in my neck and I had lots of tests and um, found out that it was thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time that I went for my surgery, I found out that my cholesterol was really high. Um, which was a real surprise to me because I thought that I was healthy and eating well and exercising and all those good things. But um, it was really for my own research, you know, kind of nothing more than Googling like how to reduce cancer risk and how to reduce cholesterol that I stumbled across plant-based and lifestyle medicine. And Michael Gregor and How Not to Die was the first book I read that then led me down this path of, you know, the China study and Colin Campbell and all the ones that you'll be familiar with. Um, and that's really how my journey started. It was me as a patient and not, not as a doctor, as most people would expect. Wow. That's so interesting when the doctor becomes the patient. So you literally just, what, what did you Google? Do you remember what the keywords were? Because I'm so curious how you found this. Yeah, it was definitely, it was nothing fancier than, a, you know, the combination of reducing my cancer risk and reducing my cholesterol. <laughs> you know, nothing more medical than that. Like really when I became a patient, like those are probably the key words that I was looking for. Um, and I didn't take too much digging around to find the plant-based lifestyle message. And I'm so glad for that because it's really changed the, the trajectory of my health and also my professional career. So been had quite heard, something. Had you heard about a plant-based diet before? No, absolutely not. And all my training in the UK, and then I had to retrain when I went to Canada and do all my Canadian exams after I'd finished all my UK exams. And in all that training, I can tell you, I maybe had like a handful of hours of education on nutrition, and it was never plant-based. So it was really, really brand new to me. Um, that's kind of what made it really exciting. So when you found out that plant-based diets could arrest and reverse different diseases, were you excited? Were you angry? Did you ever wonder why you didn't learn this in medical school? Yeah, gosh, I had so many emotions, all those things that you, um, that you just mentioned. I did feel really angry because I, I was quite like, you know, why have I not been taught this before? And I felt quite upset because I felt like, you know, thinking back on all the patients that I had seen, I just felt like I had had such a missed opportunity where I really could have done better. Um, but that's not really helpful way to think about it. So I think what I try and focus on now is now I do know better and I do try better and, and use this plant-based approach with my patients. So that's really important for me to focus on. But yeah, such a range of emotions, like, really frustrated that it didn't come up come up in my medical school curriculum or my GP training, my UK training, my Canadian training. Like there were so many opportunities where I should have been taught about plant-based lifestyle so that I could help my patients. And um yeah, but then it was all just brand new to me when when I did discover it. Why do you think that nutrition isn't taught in medical schools? And has anyone even like said to them, hey, why aren't you teaching this? Um I don't know if I really know the reason as to why it's been missing from the curriculum for all this time. 
I think as we know, like our healthcare systems, like here in the UK, as well as over, over across the pond where you are, it's such a reactive healthcare system. Like we only see patients when they're ill. Um, and so the focus is really on managing the disease as opposed to getting to the re root cause of the conditions that they might be experiencing. So a lot of the focus is shifted to that as opposed to preventative medicine. And of course, you know that the pharmaceutical industry is you know, worth a lot of money and a lot of focus is on that as well. And it certainly was in my training. But since I kind of have been introduced to lifestyle medicine and have learned more about it and have been more involved in conferences and training like I I see that a shift is happening and I think that more medical students and junior doctors are becoming really interested in a plant-based approach and in lifestyle medicine and actually just recently in the UK they're, they've launched a nutrition program into the curriculum of medical schools. I don't know how much is plant-based, um, but, but change is happening. Um, for me, it just feels a little bit slow, but it's definitely there, which is a good thing. Well, you know, it's one thing that they're not teaching plant-based nutrition, which we all believe is superior, but that they just weren't teaching any, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's right. And then, you know, there was a study in the BMJ, I think it was about a year ago, and they interviewed um, medical students and doctors and the overwhelming majority, like more than 90% of them understood that nutrition was really important and they really wanted to learn more about it. But actually only something like 26 or 27% of them felt confident talking to their patients about it. And that was because, you know, universally doctors just have such little emphasis on nutrition training, never mind plant-based nutrition never mind plant-based diet training so your the lump was found in your throat during an, a routine examination did anyone give you any explanation for what might have caused it what was what did they say no never and actually I feel like it was just really um really lucky that I had a very thorough obstetrician this was like my routine 12 week appointment in my second pregnancy um, and truthfully, I had a really complicated second pregnancy and my daughter was born with um, a few medical conditions that that required a lot of my time and attention and energy and focus and all those things after she was born that I really forgot about the lump that was found in my um, neck. And so it was only when she was kind of four or five months old where I started to, you know, I remembered about it and then kind of put myself first again and started to, to get the tests and things that I needed. But really at no point um whether it was an appointment with my endocrinologist or my oncologist or my family physician nobody mentioned nutrition nobody mentioned lifestyle habits and um, not even about you know preventative or trying to help me it was more about like even I felt like there should have been such a place for that in my recovery which was really hard like I got my diagnosis the day after I returned from maternity leave so there's loads of emotions around the time of my diagnosis and um, I remember the only thing that was said to me you know my GP when I did tell her that I was struggling which took me a lot to admit and um, you know she said maybe you should do more yoga she kind of said it with a smile and it was like a, it was just like a fleeting comment um, so really, that's all that I ever experienced. Wow. Well, I'm sorry this happened to you, but, you know, I always like to look for the gift. And if it hadn't happened to you, you might not be where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really believe that. So in some strange kind of way, I am very thankful for, for the experience that I've had with that. What was it like having the tables turn, being the patient? I, I bet you learn a lot. Yeah, I mean... It was really nothing short of life changing, to be honest, like on a personal level and a professional level. And, you know, I think what most people maybe don't realize so much is that as doctors, like and especially as general practitioners or family physicians, as, as you guys call it, um, there is a lot of emphasis on how to communicate well with patients and how to put patients at the center of care and how to think about them holistically. Like there, there is a lot of emphasis on that for sure. And I always felt like that was the stuff I was really interested in and care a lot about my patients, like super curious about their lifestyles. And I always thought I understood the patient journey pretty well, um, but nothing prepared me for 
having the tables turned and certainly you know not my training not the exams that I did not the experience you know managing my own patients or running my own practice like nothing gave me the same insight as I had as a patient you know waiting in the waiting room or um waiting for results or getting a, a call with results like that was really such an eye-opening experience and it certainly allowed me to be much more compassionate as a doctor even more compassionate and really like understand what my patients are going through which I think is is a really helpful thing do you think you were treated any differently being a doctor maybe better or yeah in some in some ways better like I um certainly my oncologist showed me a lot of professional courtesy and I think I got my surgery date a bit earlier um, than if I hadn't been. He, he knew that I had just returned to work and was keen to, to get back to work and, and stay there. And so, so that was definitely a plus that I'm very grateful for. Um, but I think in other ways, I maybe was treated a bit unfairly. So for example, when my pathology results came through after my surgery, um, they were emailed to me <laughs> you know I didn't have an appointment I didn't wasn't sitting down in a face-to-face -face conversation or consultation with a doctor like they were sent as an email so I think maybe that was done because they maybe thought they were saving me time for going down to an appointment or I could just read them and understand them but actually I think it was really forgotten that I was you know a person and a mum and a wife and that um yeah like I was maybe treated more of a doctor there when I wish I hadn't been yeah well because a lot of times you know I'm not saying all doctors but a lot of doctors are like I'm the doctor I know best you do this but you're also a doctor so you you know a lot of what they're, they're telling you <clears throat> right yeah that's interesting you had your family I believe your parents also had some medical concerns yeah, and so that certainly being like an interesting part of my journey, because at the beginning, they were very skeptical about what I was doing with my diet. Um, but my shortly after my diagnosis, my dad had a stroke. Um, and just before mine, and then after my dad's, like my mom has had two separate cancer diagnoses. So certainly, like our health has been at the forefront of all of our minds. Um, and I think has encouraged them certainly to take what I've been telling them much more seriously because you know like we kind of touched on we've kind of got this reactive healthcare system and I find most people will take action not preventatively um, but certainly like after they've had a diagnosis and that's certainly been true with all of us um, but yeah it's been really quite special to have them on the journey with me and with my family too. So did, did they eventually buy in your whole family? Yeah, there. So my parents were first to buy in, like, as I said, like after being quite skeptical. Um, but I think they really understood what I was telling them. And of course, I was telling them patient stories all the time, too, and like sending them pictures of, you know, blood work and, um, and yeah, just like stories of all these amazing things that my my patients were experiencing. So so they did, they put in, and also my mom is a home economics teacher, so she loves to cook. Um, and she's really got herself very involved in different ingredients and recipes, and that's been really fun. Like I've definitely taken advantage of that. And then I think my sister and my brother-in-law, like they follow followed closely after. And it's really made everything very much easier because we spend, a, we're a very close family and we spend a lot of time together and we really enjoy our food. You know, we'll be having one meal and planning the next. And um, so it's certainly been a lot easier to all be on a plant-based journey together. Husband and children on board as well? Yes, husband, definitely. My kids, um, they're not completely plant-based because of course we're trying to navigate play dates and parties and school meals and um, so it's a bit more relaxed there and um, they're maybe more vegetarian and um, rather than vegan although they'll identify themselves as vegan and um, because they have a very good understanding I mean they're still they're young right like they're six and they're eight and um, but they really understand about being kind to animals and trying to look after the planet so that for them is very important um, and it's really nice to, to see that within them at such a young age. So how is everyone's health now? 
everyone's good thank you very much that really is- good really healthy and feeling really well thank you that is fantastic how long did it take after you started implementing whole food plant-based into your life and your family's life to start teaching it to patients how did that work really quite really quickly actually like I am um, Roger and I changed our diet very quickly which I know is not maybe how it's best for everybody like um, I think the majority of people tend to maybe go about it a bit more slowly and maybe make one change at a time and certainly for most people that's a really that's how I encourage them to do it and it can be more sustainable that way but we changed our own diet and our lifestyle very very quickly and I really immersed myself in in the research and the books and the documentaries and all those kind of things and I it really wasn't long like maybe a matter of weeks or so before I started almost feeling uncomfortable at work if I wasn't mentioning it um, because there was just so many opportunities to do that because as you probably know you know kind of 80 percent of what we see as a general practitioner is heart disease high blood pressure high cholesterol knee pain arthritis like all these things where I felt like there was an opportunity at least to open up the conversation about it and that if I wasn't doing that I was doing my patients a disservice at least to offer them something different or something alongside conventional medicine Um, and I was amazed because so many of them were really receptive to this message that you know the food that they put on their plate actually really mattered and actually could do a lot for their health so it was really exciting for me to you know take that into work because I remember my sister telling me like Laura stop preaching to your friends like you're gonna not have any less um but so I was really fortunate to be in the position as a family physician to then take what I had learned into work like I was really grateful for that because I was able to kind of spread the message in a way that was evidence-based and that was going to do the most benefit for my patients and also the least harm and that was exciting for me because I was used to handing over so many prescriptions and counseling about cost and side effects and so on and so it felt really satisfying and yeah I can't imagine practicing medicine any other way now. Who was it easier to if you will convince your family your patients your colleagues Um, I put colleagues last I feel like every time they heard me say plant-based nutrition they'd kind of roll their eyes and be like there she goes again Um, and then I think with my patients it was really quite variable there were some people who bought in like very quickly straight away and then other people that took more time and that was something that I enjoyed very much as being a family physician you know your appointments with your patients are quite short but you can see them time and time again and you build up that relationship over many months. And so I always felt like, you know, I was kind of planting the seed, but then being able to bring them back for opportunity to discuss it more. Um, I don't know. I I mean, as you know, my parents, you know, it took some time. My sister, my brother-in-law, as I mentioned, kind of followed closely after. And then with my patients, it's just been really variable, but I'm so proud of every one of them. How quickly did your own transition take place? Like you read How Not to Die, and then were you plant-based the next yes. meal or was it more slowly like you take you took things out or added things in no honestly chef ad like once i once i read how not to die and i i like i couldn't put it once i picked it up i couldn't put it down i think it only took me a few days to get through and as you know like it's massive i think it's behind me on my bookshelf there it's huge um that i i really like it was the next day it just felt very strange to me because i to, to eat any of those animal products that he had been talking about and um, I never really ate so much red meat in my diet I just never have never really enjoyed it I had a huge amount of dairy and so many eggs that's probably why my cholesterol was so high um, and and lots of fish and so it, it just like very quickly like my taste changed and I just was not interested in eating these things anymore and of course then I discovered how good I felt including so many other new things into my diet you know I think as you've probably heard like so many people think that a vegan diet is restrictive when in actual fact the opposite has been true for me like I've included so many new and other things into my diet like tofu and tempeh and beans and lentils and all these things that I ate very rarely beforehand but now form like the majority of my diet. How quickly did it take for your cholesterol to normalize? 
Um, well, you know, I had my repeat test. It must have been about, it was a while ago now, so I don't remember it exactly, but it was between two and three months. Um, I remember thinking it would be, it was about the same time as I would recheck somebody who was on a statin. Um, so it was, it wasn't very long at all. And it dropped considerably, like it was really exciting to see that. It's amazing to me because so many people read how not to die. And yet some doctors just say, yeah, this is great. And then others just don't respond in any way. Mm. I know. I, I, I can't see how you could read that and not be completely sold on, on everything that he did. Were there any foods that were difficult at first for either you or your family to decrease or give up at the beginning? Or did you just, were you always a good cook and then you just took to plant-based cooking right away? Yeah, I really can't say that I find it difficult to eliminate, to, to eliminate any of it. Like I felt so strongly in what I was doing. And then of course I felt so much better so quickly, you know, much more energized, less bloated, um, you know, all these things. Uh, and I think also more than anything, I just really felt like I was doing something to take control of my health. And I think that's something I see in common with my cancer patients. I see, you know, they really feel very vulnerable and really feel like the control has been taken away from them. And that's certainly something I've experienced by eating this way. Like every day, I feel like I'm making a good choice for, you know, for my future. So so yeah, no, I, I can't say that I find it difficult. Like it's certainly been a learning process and a journey and that like, I feel like the more I've learned, the more things I've incorporated and I'm getting better at doing things all the time and learn, like the learning never stops. Um, but it's been, I don't know that I would say it's been difficult, but it's certainly been really enjoyable. Great. What surprised you the most about using plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine in your practice? Um, I mean, I think initially, like how effective it was, right? Like I had read the books and, you know, immersed myself in the research, but then to translate that into like everyday practice and see the results and see it in front of my eyes, I mean, that was phenomenal. And then, you know, what's also so surprising about it is like how quickly you see those results. So for most people, I would say like when I was, see them back for a follow-up appointment, you know, two to three, maybe four months later, their blood pressure was dropping, their A1C, their sugar level was dropping. And um, all these things were happening quite quickly. And, and that was just incredible for me to see that. Well, I'm sorry. Are your patients seeking you out specifically because you practice lifestyle medicine or do they just come to you because you're a doctor and then you kind of spring it on them? Yeah. Maybe both. I mean yeah a bit a bit of both like it was different when I was practicing in Toronto then I you know I had my own family practice uh my patients knew me really well but they won't have known you know the kind of approach that I was taking until they'd spent like 30 seconds in the seat in front of me and then they would you know they would know for sure um and they started to kind of I saw I had a lot of families right like as family physicians do and so they would kind of talk amongst themselves and um, sometimes they would come in and say, you know, really interested in what happened to my sister's cholesterol. Like, can you tell me about it too? So that was really exciting. Um, but in the UK, like we, you know, we are working with the rest of the team that you've been interviewing. Um, we're very open and transparent about what we're doing, you know, in our title is plant-based health professionals or plant-based health online. And, and we did that very deliberately, even though some people didn't agree with us of doing that and um, so people who come to us now I think have a very good idea of the approach that we're taking um, and we also try to make the message uh, transparent that we're not dogmatic about our approach and certainly not exclusive you know we welcome everybody at all stages of their journey um, and I think that that's really important but yes most people have an idea of what we're doing when they come to us now. Do you have any stories you could share of any patients where you utilize lifestyle medicine and had a favorable outcome? Yeah, I have so many. Um, one, well, just recently we've been starting, we've, we've started to run virtual group consultations with our patients at Plant Based Health Online. And that's been really amazing. Like that's a new way of practicing medicine for me instead of just seeing patients one-to-one. -one. Like I love doing that and there's certainly a place for it, but 
bringing patients together in groups has been so rewarding um, and really incredible to see these patients coming together to support each other and learn from each other. And so just a month or so ago, we led a group for breast cancer patients. Um, and there is a patient in particular who has fully embraced a plant-based lifestyle and has reduced her cholesterol significantly, feels like she's really taking char um, charge of her health. And not so long ago, she um, emailed me to tell me that she's out running her friends when she's going out for a run with them. And for me, I just, that was amazing. But, you know, for somebody who's just very recently gone through breast cancer treatment, I just thought that that was incredible. So she's uh, really proud of all my patients, but she's certainly like a, a star patient. That is great. How did you get involved with UK health professionals? And maybe you could tell the viewers what it is in case they're watching this episode, maybe didn't watch the other episodes of the week. Yeah, for sure. So I, when I moved back from Toronto, I was really keen to kind of try and find healthcare professionals who were practicing in a similar way to me. And I took myself off down to, so I'm in Glasgow, Scotland, and I had taken myself down to London for the weekend and gone to the VegMed conference organized by plant-based healthcare professionals. And Dr. Shireen Kassam, who you did an, an amazing interview with, um, she founded healthcare, Plant-Based Healthcare Professionals UK and she organized this conference. And it was incredible, like Michael Greger was there and Neil Bernard and Brenda Davis, like I was just on the edge of my seat the, the whole weekend, it really was amazing. And then shortly afterwards, a friend and colleague of mine who had been at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine Conference in the States had sat beside Shireen at the conference and had sent me <laughs> a picture of her holding up her name badge and was like, you should really get in touch with her. She's phenomenal. Um, and she is, just as you will know, because you've spoken to her. Um, and so we connected and you know, I told Shireen about my story and what I was doing at the time I was practicing kind of lifestyle medicine here in Glasgow privately um, and then I kind of just realized that we shared a lot of common with our approach and passion for plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine and shortly afterwards when the pandemic started and um, we saw that the um, Neil Bernard was doing virtual plant-based lifestyle medicine consultations over there I think Shireen suggested that it would be a really good idea to do something like that here. Um, and that's exactly what we did. We kind of designed and planned that and then launched Plant-Based Health Online just earlier this year in January 2021. That's fantastic. So how it's all come together. Yeah, it's been very exciting. That's, that's wonderful. Is there a difference in the way lifestyle medicine is practiced in Scotland versus Toronto, or maybe in the way you were able to practice it in those two countries? Yeah, so the main difference here is that the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine is not a plant-based movement. And that was the biggest shock for me and disappointment, if I'm being brutally honest. Um, they just do not advocate for a plant-based diet here. It's a much more generic message of we should avoid processed foods. That's kind of the best they're doing at the moment. And I have been really upset and disappointed and frustrated because when I learned about lifestyle medicine in North America, it was very clear that it was a plant-based approach and that was the best and that's what the evidence shows and that's what we believe. Um, so that's been uh, challenging, I guess, to kind of get my head around. But I think it's a, the, the movement, the lifestyle movement in the UK is not quite as well established as it is in the States. And so things are growing and changing all the time and uh, we're trying to give our plant-based input as much as we can. Well, I mean, I think the message to avoid processed food and ultra processed food is a, is a very good one. And I see yeah. a lot of vegans getting stuck in that trap of eating all the processed food, but I'm not sure it's enough, but I, I don't want to like berate or argue with people that have that message. Cause I think it's, it's a good message, but like you say, I don't think it's a complete message. Exactly. That's exactly it. It's a very important message. And certainly in the UK here, we're eating far too many processed foods. So that message is very important. Um, I just feel like we can do a little bit better and take it a bit further. Um, but hopefully, 
hopefully we'll get there in time. Like, I'm, I'm just curious because I've never been to the UK. I have a cousin that actually lives in England, but what are the processed foods that, that they're eating? Like I can think of, you know, the United States and I think of like, we have a store called 7-Eleven and I know myself, I yeah. drink Slurpees every day for breakfast and Dr. Pepper for lunch. So it was sodas, but a lot of snack foods like, you know, Doritos and flaming Cheetos and Fritos. And is, is it the same or do you have like different kinds of snack foods? Like, because you maybe have different diets. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably much the same in terms of these processed foods that are high in salt and high in sugar and, um, you know, a lot of the sweetened drinks, for example. So I'm in Glasgow in Scotland, so we have some of our own like terrible um, processed food examples. We've also got Iron Brew, which is like a fluorescent orange fizzy drink. I mean, it's horrible. Um, and then they really like to deep fry things here in Glasgow. So they'll, you know, take a sausage, which we know is terribly unhealthy, but then they'll deep fry it and make it even worse, <laughs> make it even worse. Um, so we've got like a lot of work on our hands because certainly these processed foods are really, really common and, you know, so overconsumed. Um, But I think that we just need to try and keep going with our message about whole foods and plant foods and, hope that people pick up on it but it's obviously much more complicated than, than just that. It has uh, McDonald's infiltrated your company and our, our fast is fast food as popular as it is here? Yeah it's it's everywhere it's everywhere. Cool. That is not very good well you know speaking of food one of the questions that I think every guest that's ever been on Chef AJ Live guess is what do you eat? Yeah, so I'm such a creature of habits. I tend to follow the same kind of things most days, which I think like even though we try and make our our intake, like a, our, our food as diverse as possible, which try and do, um, still every day I probably have similar things. So I'll usually start um, with breakfast porridge and nuts and seeds and berries. Um, and I usually have it with decaf coffee and some soy milk. That's like my favorite. Um, and then lunchtime, I normally have like a baked potato or um, some sourdough with hummus. And I, I like putting broccoli sprouts or bean sprouts on top of it. Um, and then in the evening, usually just well, the, the, the dinner I like making the most is the one that I only have to make one of because all four of us will eat it. And that'll be like a really mild kind of chickpea and vegetable curry. Like my kids will eat that. My husband loves it and I love it too. So that's always, always a winner. Uh, well, you mentioned potato, which is like my favorite food. Are people in the UK as afraid mm -hmm. of eating carbs as many people in the United States are? Yeah, I think there's definitely still very much ingrained this message of like, you know, if you want to lose weight, then avoid carbs. That's definitely something I see a lot of. Um, but yeah, I also wish that people would embrace potatoes as much as we did. But the I just opposite, noticed my light has gone off, sorry. Opposite that's true if you want to lose weight. Eat carbs, but whole carbs, complex carbs. Yeah, yeah. Just getting that message clear to people is something I think that's really important, important to do. Do you like to do any kind of batch cooking? Oh gosh, I mean, in theory, yes, it would certainly make my week a lot easier, kind of trying to also navigate the kids and their activities and homework and all the rest of it. Um, but I tend to find, I mean, so sometimes I'll go through stages of batch cooking, but more often than not, it's really about, um, for what I love is kind of no recipe meals, like throwing together big salads or big curries, like without any any real meals and then I tend to just make a little bit more when I'm making them and then we'll have some leftovers but batch cooking is what I tell my patients to do so I should probably do, do that myself can be really helpful can be. are any of the tools that are very popular here popular in the UK as well for instance I love my instant pot I love my air fryer oh you know what I've been looking at the instant pot for ages and, so, and one of my friends has it and absolutely loves it I don't have it um what are the things that are popular here? A, a lot of my patients will have the Nutribullet or um, have the Vitamix over there. It's just so expensive. But the Nutribullet is really good for smoothies or making hummus or a salad dressing. So I really, that's a tool that I use a lot. 
and then my magi mix as well is something I use a lot for making energy balls for the kids and like putting lots of nuts and seeds and, and things in it so those are probably my two most used tools in the kitchen that's great you have, are you an avid exerciser do you have time for that I make time for that every single day it's become part of my daily my daily routine that's not up for negotiation really so as a kid I was quite sporty I was a, a swimmer I used to swim it every day and then I have always enjoyed the gym and working out but since my diagnosis and since finding about the about the impact of the exercise and um, reducing the risk of cancer recurrence specifically um, amongst all the other health benefits that's just become something that I do every day like I wake up before I before I'm even fully awake I'm like on the bike or doing my home workout or on the tread or something like that and I'm always feel much better for it wow that's good yeah like, like you say you make time for it because we all have the same yeah. amount of time it's it really yeah I find if I don't do it first thing in the morning it doesn't get done that's same same I can make up any excuse every excuse under the sun so I've learned that I get up I, I like I always have my workout clothes I that's like the last thing I do before I go to bed as I kind of fall into them in the morning and then um, yeah that's it uh, I'm a much better person after yeah. I've done my workout same here much better mood you know <laughs> yeah. sometimes I even sleep in my workout clothes because it just saves <laughs> time in the morning everything but the that's a good one yeah that's, that's, what, I, that's, that's that. what I have to do and also it helps that my spin bike is literally right next to where I sleep so it's like it's it's it will haunt me all day if I don't get it you know <laughs> That, that's so that's so funny yeah, yeah I'm I'm exactly the same way yeah. are there any lessons you learned from different healthcare systems that could improve patient care oh gosh um any healthcare system? I mean ultimately I think you know I've worked in two healthcare systems right like in in Toronto and here too and I think they're they're both very very similar actually I think what I would just really love to see is that we were a bit more proactive rather than reactive and that the message that I would give to patients, no matter what kind of healthcare system that they're in, is to try not to wait for a diagnosis before you, you know, take positive action for your health. So that's kind of putting responsibility on the patient, on the person rather than the healthcare system, which I think we have to do, especially just now at the time of the pandemic where everybody's kind of overwhelmed and overburdened with with looking after COVID patients so um I think that that's that would probably be my message we talk about not waiting till a diagnosis I mean you kind of did too you know well I know that's right it sounds a bit hypocritical doesn't it mm -hmm. um but then I suppose we've always got to learn from the lessons that we've been through to try and help others um I just don't see it very often and I think that's really because we take our health for granted um until something goes wrong you know you i think people take and i didn't mean to like shame you for that i'm just saying because i bet you probably ate fairly healthy or thought you ate fairly healthy before right i thought i did you know i i really didn't eat very many processed foods i didn't eat too much red meat although i don't think i had a good understanding of the impact of that on my health at the time um yeah i thought i was healthy and i didn't think there was much you know from the red wine that i would be drinking at the weekend either um so it really has been this huge learning curve and you know like we said that my diagnosis while well, in some ways I wish it hadn't happened I'm very glad because it opened up my eyes to all of this um plant-based nutrition and lifestyle medicine but and I and I kind of wonder if that hadn't happened you know would I have I hope that I would have ended up down this path anyway but so I don't know I hope that people can still kind of take you know my experience my journey and kind of use it to maybe just think twice about this idea of not waiting for something to go wrong or wait for a diagnosis before before you take you know healthy action right you know i think like i said people take better care of their cars they generally take them in for a tune-up every five thousand miles mm -hmm. when that little light comes on but not so much their bodies i mean because there are warning lights for our body but i think people don't pay attention I agree i think we're always or often so busy that we don't stop and listen and become, you know, super in tune with what's going on. And um, so that idea of, of becoming more aware, more insightful, like recognizing signals of stress or poor health is, is so important. Didn't somebody say that if you don't take time for your health, you better 
make time for your illness. Yeah, yeah, that's so true, isn't it? So do you have a favorite uh, condition that you like to treat with lifestyle medicine and a plant-based diet? Oh gosh, um, I mean, I don't know if there, you know, there's so many, right? Like, and it applies to so many, like high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And, you know, I really like treating those because plant-based medicine is so effective there and really can do feel like I'm offering people an opportunity to use something, you know, their, their diet, their food choices as a really powerful tool, as an alternative to medication and that feels really rewarding like really really re rewarding and I, I don't think I'll ever get tired of that um but I find that there's something really special about using this approach with with cancer patients maybe because of my own experience and maybe because of this kind of I still feel like I kind of carry around a bit of a, a heavy feeling you know with all the patients cancer patients that I'd seen before I knew about plant-based medicine I remember I said like I kind of feel like I could have done much better so now when I'm seeing cancer patients and trying to improve their outcomes and cancer survivorship, um, that for me feels like a really special thing to do. Do you work with people in person? So if people lived where you live, they could come in and see you? At the moment, I don't. At the moment, I'm doing all my work remotely. So by video consultation. Um, but you know, that is working really, really well. It's giving me such a broad reach, like out beyond Glasgow and Scotland I'm able to see people in England and Wales and some parts of Ireland so that feels amazing and I've been so pleasantly surprised to see how well you can form a connection you know through a zoom call I mean it's quite incredible so it, it really it, it doesn't replace seeing people online and I certainly I do part of me does really miss that but there's so many benefits as well that I'm really enjoying seeing people remotely. Yeah, it does seem that in a lot of ways, the Zoom is more intimate and the doctor is less distracted because, it, you know, yeah. they've got all these, oh, they don't have a waiting room full of patients. Yeah, that's so true. I haven't thought about it like that before. Um, and it just, yeah, it maybe does just feel a bit more relaxed. And I think because of that, and certainly for me, like from a personal level, you know, I'm not looking at my watch thinking I need to rush and get out of the parking space and go and get the kids from school. You know, it's much more like I am probably much more Okay. Yeah, more present. Do you, yeah. uh, where can a person live to take advantage of your services online? Or where must they live, in other words? Yeah, so for me as a doctor on plant based health online, I can see patients within the UK. Um, but our dietitian, Lisa Simon, who we've also done an interview with, who is just amazing, um, she's able to see people um, everywhere, actually, apart from America and Canada. So she can see people all across Europe. At the moment, we have, we're have we not able to see people in America or Canada, but maybe things will change in time. So funny. Why is North America excluded from your wonderful services? I know that feels terrible to exclude you guys, but um, I think it comes down to kind of insurance. And um, I think that's the main reason, really. Yeah. Something maybe for us to look at in the future. Right. What do you wish more people knew, Dr. Freeman, in general about health or specifically about lifestyle, lifestyle medicine and their choices? Yeah, I think, you know, what we were saying about not taking your health for granted, like I really feel like I wish more people were in tune with that. And then ultimately that they knew about the power of plant based nutrition and how much of an impact it can have, you know, for their physical health, for their emotional health you know, for all the conditions that we've, we've learned about and talked about today. And then, you know, an area that we haven't touched on that I'm really passionate about is the is planetary health, you know, and the climate crisis. And I would love for people to make that connection between, you know, that we are so connected, you know, our health and the health of the planet. And that by following a plant-based diet, you know, it's such a win-win situation. We can improve our health and we can protect the planet. And um, that's probably the main thing I wish people would open up their eyes to at the moment. Yeah. You know, I find it really interesting when I asked you earlier about who was it easier to uh, persuade or convince to try a plant-based diet. And you said the family and the patients are easier than the colleagues. The colleagues that are resistant, is it because they feel that it's not effective or it will be too hard? Or I I'm just curious what their actual resistance is. I wish I knew. I think it changes between the different professionals like 
I think some people just it really comes from not knowing and understanding enough about it I feel like there are still so many misconceptions like so many myths you know all the ones that you will have heard over and over again about protein and calcium and you know soy is not good for you and all these things are still really um kind of widely and commonly felt by lots of healthcare practitioners and um I think that they think you know their patients don't want to hear it or they're going to find it too difficult or perhaps they're just not confident explaining it with you know counseling their patients on it so I think there's lots and lots of different reasons um any colleagues you were able to any colleagues you were able to persuade um I definitely planted a lot of seeds when I was in Toronto and I held like some you know we used to have journal club every so often like once a month I think it was and that's why I would organize like a plant-based journal club and bake some plant-based treats and take them along and and certainly I think some people were just starting to think about it and listen to some of the things that we say and certainly every time I had a patient whose blood pressure dropped or cholesterol dropped I used to always bring up their results on my computer screen and like pull people through and be like come and come and look at this so that they could actually see it so I think that they were starting to um, understand why I was so excited about it and um, whether they've kind of continued to to embrace that I'm not so sure. But you know even if it is too difficult to embrace which I don't believe it's any more difficult than eating the standard American diet other than maybe you can't drive through McDonald's it still should be offered. I mean, let the patient right. decide whether it's too difficult, not the doctor. I'm not going to tell you about something that you can do to avoid open heart surgery because I think it's too difficult. I mean, that kind of is offensive in a way. Yeah, I agree. It's almost like they know better, whereas, you know, it should really like a really good doctor, I feel like, should be driven by the patient's agenda. You know, of course, taking into account, you know, what's safe and appropriate and evidence based and all those things. But I definitely agree with that, like give your patient the chance, like give them the opportunity, give them the information. Um, and certainly what I found is that the major, vast majority of patients were really open to it. There was very few people that said to me, no, I'm not interested. Or um, there was one lady who said she would rather continue to eat bacon and drink Coke until she died. <laughs> um, but she was really in the minority. Definitely more people were open to it than closed. Yeah, but at least at least you gave her the option and you can write in the chart patient yeah. going against medical advice, refusing yeah. to try a plant-based <laughs> diet. Yeah, I think I, I believe I quoted her exact words exactly in the in the computer chart so that I always had a record of her. I couldn't quite believe it. Um some people were just like that and I had to respect it, but I did feel like at least I had given her the opportunity to find out more and 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 do more. You know, it's interesting is that, I mean, I think that in some cases when a patient isn't compliant, a doctor can actually drop them as a patient and it'd be kind of cool to say, eat this or find another doctor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess I would just always hope that, you know, while some people don't take everything on immediately as you're, as you're talking to them, um, I always kind of hope that sometimes they would come back um, and think about what you had said and give them some and some time and consideration to go over that and so we kind of always took the approach that my door was open to talk about it more when they wanted to you know it's interesting that you mentioned that the british lifestyle medical society is not promoting or doesn't seem to even be that interested in plant-based diets so i'm wondering what are they promoting as lifestyle medicine yeah so there the the the, the pillar of nutrition in the british society of lifestyle medicine is hotly debated and it seems to be uh well exactly that it's hotly debated and so a lot of focus is on the other pillars which are also extremely important like certainly we can't take any of them in isolation if we're going to achieve you know optimal health and um, so certainly they're doing a lot of really great work with movement and you know positive psychology and connections and you know reducing exposure to to toxins and risky substances so they're doing a lot of great work. Well, what are they recommending for weight loss and, and how bad is the obesity epidemic in the UK in general and with specific, in, specifically with children? Yeah, so I think we're maybe not quite as bad as the statistics in the US, but certainly not far behind. And the trends that we're seeing with 
um, childhood obesity or, or trending upwards. So it's certainly a very um, current problem. Um, in terms of weight loss and the approach that the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine take, you know, I'm, I would have to tell you I'm not sure. And I think that that is part of the problem. Like when you're not clear on your nutritional standpoint, it leaves everybody very confused. Um, and, and so I think, you know, even my answer there about being unsure is a very good reflection that uh, the message is not message from them is not clear and I think that that's such a shame because I feel like we have enough evidence we have enough experience as physicians to to say you know what works um so it would be nice to see that changing in the future well, in the United States a lot of doctors uh, they're not plant-based doctors though are promoting the keto diet for people that have di type 2 diabetes and want to lose weight because even though it's mortgaging their health in the long term in the short term it can be effective for weight loss and i'm learning from the doctors i interview that really what they're losing is not fat but muscle is it very popular in the uk this keto craze as it is here yeah i think it is popular i think it's being talked about a lot on different forums and patient groups and, and that kind of thing as well as the low carb approach especially with type 2 diabetes type 2 diabetes so low carb approaches are very common um, method used for those patients um, kind of feels quite disappointing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's too bad that that. Uh, <laughs> when are people going to learn? So I'm curious, what personal habit do you have that you're most proud of and why? Yeah, so I think, you know, I'll always feel quite proud of my diet and the way I eat and certainly the way we, the way that we very first started was that we would be plant-based at home but we would do what we wanted you know at friends or out in restaurants so as not to inconvenience anybody that's how we started out um, and we've certainly changed our ways in that now we'll choose vegan restaurants our friends know about how we eat and they've been wonderful and really accepting of that so um so I, I feel proud in terms of how sustainable we've made it and then just incorporated it into like a normal part of of our life every single day and then we touched on exercising I mean right now I feel really proud of that because it's very dark in the mornings and very cold and getting up an hour earlier to do my workout is something that is not always easy um but now you know like we talked about it's just because it just becomes something that I do um and just get on with it no matter what so and kind of feel proud of that too. That's great. That's that. That's great. I think that's what exercise really does. People don't understand that even if they're still overweight, it it, it really does increase your self esteem. Like just like checking it off the list when when you know you've done it every day. Yeah, and also that now that it's become part of my daily habit, I feel like the benefits have gone far beyond you know weight loss or maintaining weight or trying to look a certain way. Like it's now much more about you know, having energy and having energy for me, you know, translates into picking up the kids and taking them to the activities and doing their homework and not being like super grumpy about it because I'm feeling tired. Um, although I definitely have those days, but yeah, like feeling more energetic, sleeping better, having like feeling like my mood is brighter, feeling less anxious, which has I think been really important through the pandemic. Um, and and ultimately also like doing my best to reduce my 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 chance of of cancer recurring, and so that has been something that's really yeah really beneficial for me. Yeah, that's not talked about a lot. But how does exercise help with that? I know it helps with weight yeah. maintenance, but with with other diseases, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that why another reason why it's important. Yeah, well, so cancer. Sorry. Exercise and physical activity can be really helpful to prevent certain cancers. Um, and I think that now we have more information that our messaging to cancer patients has improved, right? So this message of you must rest and recover during your cancer treatment, like we know better than that because we have research to show that um, regular activity can improve treatment outcomes. And then beyond treatment can improve survival outcomes, can improve cancer survivorship. 
Um, and the evidence is extremely strong, especially when you combine cardio um, with strength or resistance training. That seems to be where you get the most benefit from. Um, and I love telling that to patients because even some of them who are active or maybe not incorporating strength and resistance training, you know, for example, if they're walking or if they're running, they could add like a weighted vest or rest weights, for example. And that's a really nice way to start introducing some, some resistance. So, um, so that is definitely very helpful for, for cancer patients. But then we've also got so much research, as you probably know, for it helping all the other chronic con conditions that we've talked about, like helping with blood pressure and reducing cholesterol and improving your sugar control and I mean, the list of benefits is just so extensive and um, it's really quite, quite amazing. When people say they don't have the time, they don't realize that by taking that hour in the morning, they get paid back tenfold with increased energy and more productivity. But I think it's also yeah. a little bit harder, at least for the people I've worked with, to convince them to engage in regular movement than it is even to eat right. Yeah, I think so, because, you know, the kind of natural movement has been taken out of our day. And things of, and maybe even more so with the pandemic, with so many of us working from home, we're moving even less than we did before when we had to commute or even walk from the car to the office or things like that. So I think it's now become so easy to be sedentary that it takes a lot of effort to move and um, to get up and walk around or, or, you know, to incorporate daily movement and exercise into your day. But the, the way I normally start with my patients is just to tell them to make very small, easy goals, like something that they're going to find super easy, even if it's just like a walk around the block. And the thing is, is that you feel so much better so quickly with it that you want to do more. Um, and so I find like that's a really nice way to start bringing it into to people's uh, daily routines. Right. You're, you're right. We, it, movement has been removed from most of our lives and if we're not intentional about it it's not going to happen mm -hmm. but when you do that you know the benefits that you feel are are, are so rewarding and yeah. I think people kind of catch on to it really quickly which is lovely and then what happens is when you don't exercise you actually feel bad yes <laughs> as I've talked about with me I'm always very grumpy if I miss or if I... absolutely so how can people connect with you um, so I, I use Instagram most, um, I'm Dr. Laura Freeman on Instagram, um, but then also, you know, our website is pbho.co.uk and that's got our email and some information about me and, and my team on there. So it's kind of nice to look through. That's fantastic. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our viewers? I think, you know, if we were talking about the message that I would give to, to people and so to viewers, I would just kind of end with, with exactly that message, which is, you know, please don't take your health for granted. Like, don't wait for something, don't wait for a diagnosis or something to go wrong and really value your health and really like learn about plant-based nutrition and how powerful it is and, and then go forward and embrace it. The best thing that you can do. Well, thank you so much for your inspiring story and for the work you do and for all the work that all the wonderful health professionals in the UK are doing to bring this message to your country and beyond. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. And thank you so much for giving me the, the opportunity to talk oh. about it. It's been so fun. The pleasure was mine. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another wonderful health professional that uses lifestyle medicine in the UK and beyond. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.